Hello. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight uh, to hear some wonderful work by Benita Blackburn. Um, I'm hoping that we have a good turnout. I'm not sure what's going on on campus, but something else. So, does anyone know what it is? I think there's a game. Oh, there okay. Okay. Seems to like coincide with our readings really Always. well, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> we planned that. Um, I guess you have to make a decision then, right? Between sports and humanities. So, you've all made the right choice. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You can feel smug and satisfied in that. So, welcome. Um, to this reading tonight. Uh, I want to first thank the English department um, for their support of the reading, as well as the Initiative on Race and Resilience. Um, I'd also like to thank Kelly and Alyssa uh, for their work in, in organizing this visit. Um, Benita comes to us all the way from California, and cross-country travel these days sort of feels like, I imagine it must have felt for pioneers crossing the country, it's sort of equal, equally as difficult. Um, so we're so pleased to welcome Benita here tonight, delighted to have her read from her recently released collection, How to Wrestle a Girl. From criticism about how young women talk to policing how they dress, the idea of the girl seems to be one this seems to be the one at the center of the picture. While there have been decades, maybe centuries, of stories about girlhood at the margins, girls and girlhood seem to be having their moment in the past 15 years. Mean Girls, Gone Girl, The Girl on the Train, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, the TV show, Girls. These are just a few of the, sto the stories, these are just a few of the stories about the scariest times in girlhood. That liminal space between 11 and 25 years. Narratives that deal with girls on the cusp of womanhood, that explore what it means to inhabit the childlike self while wearing the trappings of adulthood. These are important stories to tell. However, despite their popularity, these stories, in truth, are often less about girls than they are about women and the violence, manipulation, rejection, degradation, and terror that they've experienced. Depictions of these situations, and the depictions are mostly of these situations, con contribute to our over overwhelmingly to our narratives around girlhood. Our culture is rightly concerned about, and perhaps perversely titillated by, the danger to girls and women in our times, and the ram ramifications of that violence in their lives. But this obsession with girlhood is a significant thing, though, because it cumulative, cumulatively functions as a sort of playbook for what it means to be a young woman, and we read ourselves against that playbook. We decide what it means to be normal or exceptional, or in millennial language, basic or not basic, <laughs> and what it means to be valued or not valued. Mapping out the terrain of the American girl, the idea of her, not the doll, of course, necessitates reading literature alongside popular culture and mass media. The narratives we create about girlhood, from Nabokov's Lolita to Issa Rae's Awkward Black Girl, constitute a complicated cultural narrative about what it means to be a girl. And while that narrative is neither true nor false, this version of girlhood has come to be the thing that young girls in the real world have inhabited, embraced, rejected, and contested. How she, the young girl, positions herself in relation to this narrative has power, but especially for black girls. This narrative often functions to push them into adulthood. In a 2017 study that was repeated again in 2019, the Georgetown Law Center on Poverty and Inequality found that adults of all backgrounds view black girls as more adult-like and less innocent than white girls. The study found that, quote, adults believe that black girls ages 5 to 19 need less nurturing, less protection, less support, and less comfort than white girls of the same age, and that black girls are more independent, know more about adult topics, and know more about sex than white girls. What stereotypes do you believe these beliefs animate? But girlhood, of course, is about much more than sex or dawning sexuality. In a pivotal scene in the 2003 movie 13 that chronicles a young person's life, a girl jumps too quickly over that line separating girlhood from adulthood. Her experiments with sex and drugs and shoplifting lead one character to say to another, Tracy was playing with Barbies before she met Evie. Such a moment captures for me how quickly things can change, the way this particular time in our lives, in the lives of girls, demands a kind of recursive living, a holding on to childhood, an attempt to incorporate but not necessarily adopt the trappings of adulthood. And too often, race intrudes and complicates all of this. As the narrator in Blackburn's story, Lisa Bonet says, okay, so these are the things we've been told never to say in front of children or white people. 
And these truths, these feelings, these experiences of girlhood are so, are so sacred, so precious, so private, that women don't always share them with each other in the real world. And so what a task it is for a writer to honestly capture that fleeting transitional moment from earlier in a woman's life that for some becomes idealized and overwrought in the cultural imagination. What limitations are imposed when discussing the lives of girls and by whom? And how do women tell the stories of girls that reject the Nabokovian archetype of the nymph and instead focus instead on the real stories and challenges of girlhood? I've discovered how. They write a collection like Benita Blackburn's How to Wrestle a Girl. Reviewing the collection, the New York Times details how the book, quote, shines in its propensity to magnify small moments, challenge our presumptions, and dissect the beauty, danger, and wonder of girlhood. And that is what girlhood is in all its glittering, seductive nature. Beauty, danger, and wonder. It is announced through the various Barbies described in Blackburn's story, not for resale. There's daddy's girl Barbie, who, quote, feels more comfortable in groups of guys than with girls and develop repressed sexual attractions to older men. Or fat girl Barbie, who, quote, never feels ugly and alone because feelings are edible. But girlhood is also in Rowena in the story Trial of Ghosts, who meets the ghost of her closeted childhood friend, Amani, and makes sure the ghost's credit cards will work before tucking into lunch. And especially poignant is Quote, my little sister slash niece slash granddaughter slash baby cousin who doesn't know that she's pretty, so she asks everybody one post at a time. She exists in the story fam, in which we recognize ourselves and our world in her constant updating of social media, desperate craving for the ephemeral affirmation that comes from every like. These stories set in, Cal in a California that is both bright and threatening seem to subtly argue that capitalism, Hollywood, and social media are responsible for a narrative of girlhood that is too sanitized, too simplistic, too composed, and ultimately too monetized to ever capture its wild, frayed energies. Girlhood is funny, girlhood is messy, girlhood is poignant. It takes a masterful writer to both critique the way the culture defines girlhood and simultaneously celebrate what, time, what that time means for those who live or have lived in that delicate liminal space. This from the Kirkus Review. Ultimately, these are stories about the chaos of bodies, from menstruation to athletics, from sex to movie makeup. Rather than tell an overarching narrative, each story acts as a fragment of a wildly patterned mosaic, and through accumulation, patterns become clear. With brash humor and inventive energy, Blackburn sets her stories on the edge of disorder and sustains that tension throughout, boldly styled and deeply original. Melissa Phoebos in her book, Girlhood, writes that the more we want to exploit a body, the less humanity we allow it. And the project of How to Wrestle a Girl seeks to challenge that notion, wrestling the idea of girlhood away from exploitative and singularly capitalist rhetoric to tell 30 stories, primarily in flash, that use form and character to speak and voice to speak to the ways in which girlhood burns hot and bright, and also the ways in which this time where one can be vulnerable this is a time where one can be vulnerable, threatening, wise, and naive. Works by Vinita Blackburn have appeared at NewYorker.com, in Harper's Story, McSweeney's, Split Lit Magazine, The Iowa Review, Diagram, Foglifter, Electric Literature, The Virginia Quarterly Review, The Paris Review, and others. She was awarded a Breadloaf Fellowship in 2014 and has had several Pushcart Prize nominations. In addition to How to Wrestle a Girl, she's also the author of Black Jesus and Other Superheroes, and she was a finalist for the Penn Binghamton Bingham Award for Debut Fiction, um, and the recipient of the Penn America Los Angeles, Los Angeles Literary Prize in Fiction. She's originally from Compton, California, but she's currently an assistant professor of creative writing at California, California State University, Fresno. Vanita has dedicated her book to all the wild, mad girls, which I think is lovely. And as a wild, mad girl myself, it's my pleasure to welcome Vanita Blackburn to Notre Dame. Oh my gosh, that was the most thorough analysis <laughs> of my work of like of, of, of all time. Oh my gosh. And if there are any undergrads in here, just take that entire thing word for word, write a paper. <laughs> I don't think it's published anywhere. 
And also thank you, Dion, for just being amazing, for inviting me, and also for all of you guys for, for you know choosing me over the game, choosing language <laughs> over over sports, which is hard for me too sometimes. But I appreciate all the effort, and also Notre Dame is so weird and so cool. <laughs> <laughs> I did not expect it at all. So um, I toured the like this most beautiful church today, most beautiful church I've ever seen, and I got to look into the little nooks where all the bones of the saints are. Bizarre. I learned all kinds of strange things about Catholicism that I did not know, and you're going to see how much I did not know about Catholicism when I read one of my stories <laughs> that touches on that. But. I'm going to go right into it, and I do primarily do fl uh, flash fiction. I've got big stories in here, something like a third, 30 pages, or, or um, like a normal story, like 10 pages. <laughs> but I'm going to read a bunch of flash today, because that's where my, my, where my heart is. So I'll do a bunch of those, and then we'll talk. Okay, so I'm going to read from my first collection, Black Jesus and Other Superheroes. I'm going to read the title story, Black Jesus, for you guys. And just to sort of see um, kind of the arc of language. So this story is probably one of my oldest ones. Not 10 years, maybe, I don't know. It's been a while. But just to sort of, you know, see where my brain was then and sort of how it moved into, into the, the latest book. Black Jesus. After school, I arrived at home, took off my shoes at the door, kissed the eight by 10 photo of Black Jesus in the hall, ate Fruit Loops over the sink so Nana wouldn't scream if I spilled milk on the carpet, and then watched TV. I used to watch this cartoon with beasts that turned to stone in the daytime and came alive at night. This was my ritual, my afternoon ceremony of duty, love, and magic. The previous Christmas, my Nana came to live with us, my mother and me. In Los Angeles, Christmas can be deceiving, but I loved it anyway. I dreamt of cotton snow and the oily smell of plastic holly. Authenticity never made much sense, really. All that is real is what is in front of us, if the satisfaction is absolute. Aluminum icicles over the porch satisfied me deeply. Nana, not so much. I killed her. So she says. But she's, she says everything killed her, even though she's alive as a dog bite. Nana was smaller than me even then, a granddaughter of slaves and knew life without electricity and frozen waffles. She knew other things too, especially about cows, not just milking them. I'd done that at the LA County Fair. She could deliver their babies and cure their sicknesses. When Nana first entered the house, she had nothing but her long strapped leather purse, a brick thick Bible, and that photo of the darkest Christ I'd ever seen. She didn't have a suitcase or anything. I asked my mother, why did Nana have to come? She said, your mother lived with my sister and now she lives with me. That was that. Mama really is God in the mouth of a child. To her, I often prayed on bent knees in the kitchen with knuckles under my chin. Please, please, can I have money for the ice cream truck? The delicious music of Sweet Dairy Bliss grew louder. She told me she'd given me enough change the day before, which was true, but I denied it. I pleaded, no, she said. I don't want you buying anything from that musky albino. God stirred her pot and the song passed. When Nana caught me prostrate on the floor, she pulled me up and told me to honor my mother. Nana and I spent a lot of time while my mother worked. Well, I, I spent a lot of time with Nana's rules. One morning, she caught me kissing the photo of Black Jesus on my way to the bus stop. With her wet, bony palm, she slapped me downward on the left temple. I didn't know that much pain existed in all the world. She cursed me dizzy with words I didn't know yet. Then she sat me down and read the Ten Commandments to me in more words I didn't know. I did understand that there were primarily just ten. Ten laws not to be broken. That finite sensibility meant everything to me. I may not have made it through the school day without that number, having been poked with such an emotional ice pick as only my Nana could. In class, I stared at my teacher and wondered. Electricity crackled in my blood and out my ears. She had skin like fabric, a suede eel with really great breasts. Then I knew what I had to do. When I got home, I found Nana's mammoth Bible and turned to the book of Exodus and skimmed the commandments. I had to choose one, so I picked, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. My whiteout pen in hand, I blotted that out and taped another over it. Thou shalt not kiss black Jesus. <laughs> it was specific. I was contented. In exchange for the freedom to lie, I would no longer kiss Nana's black Jesus. Several weeks passed before the alterations to this particular holy text went noticed. Christmas left reluctantly and the Southern California rains came in lackluster sprinkles or vigorous downpours. I'd also discovered a few more transgressions that needed to be included in the commandments. 
Now I was free to lie at will, covet my neighbor's ass, and completely ignore the Sabbath day as needed. The day Nana found the post-it note that read, Thou shalt not drip milk on the carpet, she roared like a car crash. The Bible is God's word, she said. And God is his word. That's like trying to cover up the Lord himself. You can't put white out on God. <laughs> then they shouldn't have put God on paper, I told her. Nana belongs to the generation of obedience as success and atonement as failure. I belong to the generation of choose your own adventure. Life means adaptation and renewal. I may convert to new faiths. I may travel to foreign communities. My arm may end up in some witch doctor's stew. I may taste like soy sauce and tears. Each cell of the planet may be lovely and terrible, but we aren't afraid to look and see. Nana calmed a little, and we spoke like women. She told me Jesus had copper skin and hair of wool, which sounds a lot like my Uncle Sheldon. I confess my reason for kissing Nana's Jesus. For good luck, I said. I lied. The truth I didn't know how to say then. I never kissed a man yet, of course, not a father or a brother or a lover. Kissing that photo meant kissing the best of all men because the best of all men is the one very carefully imagined. Nana made me fix her Bible for the most part. So the commandments went, were returned to stone and I had my ritual. Several winters later, Nana isn't able to walk on her own anymore, so I stay by her most afternoons and read. She says I killed her with my defiance. I think I might be stealing her size. I grow bigger and she grows smaller. When morticians remove organs and weigh them, does anyone measure the tear of the body? What does one weigh without the heart? I'd guess as much as the dead, almost nothing. I read to her from the Bible or magazines or Christmas stories that Nana approves of, but they're never the same when I say them. My mood changes and so does hers. Tonight I tell her, the crucifix hung from the chimney with care and Santa's reindeer stood on two hooves with hips jutted to the side in the universal manner of disbelief. Jingle your bells for me, baby. We are all angels. When she is gone, I will miss her forever. Okay, that's the first story, my Jesus. And that's all I'll do for, for that collection. Thank you. <laughs> so now let's turn to some later thoughts on girlhood and weirdness. Whatever's going on in my brain. I always bounce around. I never really know, Dion, what I'm going to read until I'm like up here. So I don't know. I'm kind of wanting, I don't know. You want me to read uh, Lisa Bonet? You want to do that? I love that. Since you mentioned it, I need like a really short one. I know the other two I'll do, but. I like the idea of the concept of the father. Her desires to do it. All right. So we'll do Lisa Bonet. Let's see. Definitely see. Yeah, that one. Okay. See how that times out. Do you guys even know? I mean, this is like Gen, Gen Z, right? Do they know who Lisa Bonet is? Yeah. Uh, kinda. <laughs> no. Do you know Zoe Kravitz? That's her mom. <laughs> <laughs> They're both cute, that's fine. Lisa Bonet. Okay, so these are the things we have been told never to say in front of children or white people. When I was a kid, my grandma used to sprinkle Ajax around the door to keep evil spirits away. It was some voodoo Ramajama type thing mixed in with Southern Baptist rituals. To this day, I got crazy germ phobias and have trouble kissing my wife. Grandma taught me there are horrors you can't see and can't talk about, but that shit is out there. That was the 90s. <laughs> Back then, me and my wife both had a crush on Denise from the Cosby Show as kids. There was this episode where Denise sat on Bill Cosby's lap and she was all 80s cool with rainbow cheeks and post-apocalyptic clothes that made her look like a boy who just raided Boy George's closet. She was cool as hell, but even then I thought she kind of looked old to be on her dad's lap. <laughs> I remember when they told us Martin Luther King Jr. was not a perfect man but led a perfect cause. I thought he was bad at math and not bad at fidelity or fatherhood. There were lives at stake, you know, so you stay quiet. The books back then made slavery look uncomfortable and irrational, something obviously temporary. They, ne they never showed us the tools, the funnels to force feed slaves that tried to starve themselves to death, the spikes driven into the skulls of infants because black children were thought to be more likely to survive. Why would anyone have to survive that? It took hundreds of dead babies to prove that theory wrong. 
My wife told me about the old laws that made it impossible to prosecute the rape of a slave because black women were lascivious by nature and of course property. Even when I tell her that's terrible, she just looks at me like I don't get it. Like no matter how much empathy I can scrape together, I'll never know what it's like to be the spectacle of female pain. <clears throat> Excuse me. When that suffering is ordained as law, as theater. Bill Cosby was always Bill Cosby, even, but eventually Denise became Lisa Bonet, the actress. She got crazy. Mm -hmm. Everybody thought she was crazy. They said she and Bill had a falling out. I thought then it was because she wanted to be paid more on the show. Greedy Hollywood bitch, right? Mm -hmm. So later when Bill Cosby goes to court for drugging and raping bunches of women, we're all dot, dot, dot. Mm -hmm. Today, I want to kiss my wife as often as she'd like, which is too often. She's not strong or proud or wise or witty and is not a perfect best friend. She wakes up too early in the morning, can never find anything, but has good breath. She's not magical, never learned to swim, was severely abused as a child, and is absolutely beautiful like an egg sunny side up. I am not that attractive, I'll admit, but she likes how I think and talk and complain, so we're cool. When she tries to smash her lips on mine, I almost always wince. She tells me I'm traumatized and laughs but she's hurt, I can tell. It's the bacteria though. I've seen all the documentaries about good bacteria and bad bacteria and how we need, to some, we need some to live and would not survive as a species or planet without them. But in my head, they are large as criminals with teeth like a barracudas, all invisible and gnawing away. She looks at me when I try to explain about the film on our tongues and I fail to explain and she wants to be patient and not resentful that her childhood looked the way it did and mine didn't and we are so close to understanding each other but can't quite and are left desperate for some impossible thing. I just want her to close her mouth so I can love her. <laughs> I forgot that line is in there. <laughs> I like it. Sometimes I take out the last line if I'm trying to read. Like I'm not sold on it anymore. But um, that's, I like it. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna do Let's do smoothies. Smoothies is a different take on girlhood. It's, a, it's the expansion, I think, in my brain. So the first time a guy said I look like a man was at the Jamba Juice stand in the mall. He was a boy, probably my age and sticky from adolescence. You look like a man. He said it as if he had the right to say anything to me, as if it was important for his survival an echo of his ancestors who were my ancestors, long and black and muscled, though we were two strangers holding smoothies. His phone was three generations older than mine. I had superior sneakers, a designer sweatshirt, better moisturizer, <laughs> and even my drink held more protein and complexity, but he wielded his right to possess them all in one note of disgust. I took a sip as a man in a suit too tall to have a head in my sight line jingled the change in his pocket. You look like a man. It took a few seconds before I knew it wasn't a compliment, that it was a lesson, an exchange, that he was learning too how to be a man by not being a girl. In Sunday school, we were learning about the first man, first woman, and how Adam must have been closer to God because God made him first, and pretty much all the problems of all time came after because of Eve and a snack. I chewed a hunk of ice that hadn't broken down properly, and a woman hit, and a woman hit the head this man uh, in the heel with her stroller. The boy could have said the words like he'd say hello, or nice to meet you, or where did you get that watch, or what a wonderful day it is to be upright and breathing here together. But he said them in a different way, the way we tell strangers your shoes are untied or you have toilet paper on your ass. He saw himself in me and felt ashamed. He saw himself in me and felt proud, but pride wasn't supposed to live inside of women. So he had to walk it back, cut its throat till the blood ringed around my neck. You look like a man. Years later, it would become, you eat like a man, you walk like a man, you sound like a man. My chromosomes had not been tested. My birth certificate says female, live birth, seven pounds and three ounces. I didn't think I wanted to be loved by boys until that boy told me it was impossible. I don't remember what I looked like then, a few years ago, but I remember him. His dirty chucks, ashy corners of his mouth and dry scalp. Back then, I stared deeply at people the way children do, still curious. He existed. I didn't expect him to look back though. Children are rarely seen, but I wasn't a child anymore and had not fully realized that. Now strangers could assert their judgments on my whole body, my whole story without permission. You look like a man. 
I was three steps into the smoothie before it hit. To be a woman seemed a terrible thing to have happened, and it happened at 3.54 on a Friday when I was 14 to the sound of a blender jolted to life. Women have to be small, give birth, wear makeup. I could see all the women, the court reporters, the accountants, psychics and secretaries, biologists and senators, important but nameless, with inconvenient hairstyles and morning routines. Men got to invent women over and over, one generation after another, by the grace of God. The woman's stroller spit a toy from what must have been a child tucked inside. The mother cooed, then retrieved the toy and fed it back to the stroller. The mall was not a place to fall apart. It happened anyway. When I get hurt, usually the universe opens up a little, like a bullet through a watermelon. Things separate and scatter. It feels like this is how we really are all the time and everything else is just pretend. We pretend to have legs and skin and penises and milk ducts. We pretend some skin looks one way while other skin is different. We pretend to have green eyes and brown eyes and yellow teeth and gray teeth and the sky is blue to us in the day and black at night. We pretend lots of things that are only sort of true. When we are the sky and time and memory in the center of the earth and destiny and gods and gravity and salted oceans and children of the gods who ate their mothers and birthed the constellations and nebulas and death are a myth because everything goes into itself to begin again. There was fear and doubt on the boy's face when I finally turned away. The condemnation dissolved. I, a girl, would grow to be a better man than he and still be a woman. The sugar pooled like acid on my tongue when the feeling passed. All the other customers departed, and it was just us under the fluorescent lights together again. There seemed nothing left to prove, and a whole new point was born between us that we had not yet named. That's smoothies. <laughs> oh, let me see. Okay, I want to do. I am not keeping track of time, Dion. So I know you're like twenty. You know you said hard twenty-five. <laughs> I don't know. Right. We mentioned um, Halloween during the lunch discussion, so I think I'll read Halloween for you guys. It's a little creepy, and it's you know the weather here is a little creepy, so I think it's appropriate. <laughs> but it's also very, very much in that environment that that I uh, use for the, for the collection of Southern California and that kind of beachiness. So there's a little of that. And there's one little part in here that is totally from, actually there's like a, a big part from, the, from reality and there's like one part from my actual life and I'll tell you about it after. Um, Halloween. Esperanza and me saw a car following a girl while riding back from jujitsu practice. We were on our bikes and took Central all the way back down to the neighborhood. It was a Honda, dark green like a rental, like something nobody picks out for themselves but got because they thought it looked normal. The girl was just a few years younger than us, probably, small and thin like an uncooked pretzel and purple pants and a t-shirt. She was on her phone, looked nervous, and I could feel the pace in Esperanza's pedaling slow down, so I slowed down too. Central is, a, is usually a busy street, but not that time of day, late October near sunset on a weekday. Everybody who should be home was already home. We passed the cemetery that butts up against the elementary school. One car passed, then no cars. Invisible birds gossiped about each other from the trees. The bike ride plus actual jujitsu practice was three hours of physical activity. Esperanza wanted to stop for now and laters, but I wanted a burrito. The car and the girl drifted farther away, and then the girl turned onto Caldwell. The car followed. Now and laters are the worst candy and will yank a filling out or a whole tooth, depending on the mouth we're talking about. Esperanza pronounced them more like annihilators, the way everybody else did. Noemi had been taking turns kicking our asses for weeks. We were not good, practically speaking. I was strong enough to hold my ground, make myself heavy and hard to turn, but, no, but against Noemi's skill, it meant nothing. Noemi was like a crocodile. <laughs> She'd tuck her arms close to her body and smile like some mad ancient mini dinosaur just <laughs> waiting for us to try something that would fail. Then she snapped, and in seconds Esperanza would be colliding with the floor. I'd have a shoulder joint about to dislodge. It hurt so bad, but was beautiful. Esperanza had bigger wheels than I, a whole bigger bike actually. 
Mine was made for kids, or grown ass men who thought they were kids and liked to fling themselves upside down just to feel something. <laughs> the bigger wheels made her faster, so it was strange to be in the lead for once as we rode. That day, Noemi had jammed her finger on something unrelated to BGJ, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, at all and couldn't participate. She just coached me and Esperanza on how to escape from front facing chokes. I had to practice grabbing Esperanza by the throat over and over. Esperanza kept telling me to make it tighter, tighter, tighter. When I thought it was way too much and was about to let go, she said, okay, good. <laughs> it wasn't cold yet. October was like that. The trees were giving up their color, but it wasn't like TV with the piles of leaves that dogs jumped in and the cut of an icy breeze. The air here could get humid and balmy even if the stores wanted to sell us pumpkin colored sweaters and brown leather boots. We rode home in our t-shirts. The short sleeves rolled up under our pits. To this day, I feel like perverts drive Hondas. This <laughs> is true. The little, the little girl had been out of sight for too long, and the car too. I wasn't afraid like Esperanza yet. It didn't occur to me that I should have been until I saw her lean forward on her bike and begin to pedal past me. Sometimes it's the witnessing of a horror story that makes us forget we're in one. She pedaled for the life of that little girl, and her own. I pedaled just to keep up. Back then I had no imagination for the worst of us, those who take and take and stretch the tender parts of life to the point of breaking. I saw a play once as a kid about a detective bear that solved mysteries. I used to think about crime that way for a long time, like a child in a theater, <laughs> safely surrounded by adults who keep the danger far away on a stage. Criminals weren't actually people anymore. They were imposters playing a part, monsters inside of a human husk to hide their true selves, their buckled skin, hot dumpster breath, stained cotton balls for eyes and vinegar sweat. It doesn't take long to realize that it isn't like that at all. We pedaled and pedaled for only seconds before we stopped. We stopped because the little girl was running toward us. She'd come back from around the corner to the silent main street where there was nothing but our heartbeats and the complaints of birds in the air. I was ready to die, not for that little girl, but for Esperanza, because Esperanza chewed her dangerous candy, walked into bruises day after day, and demanded that I try to squeeze the life from her just to test her worth. I knew as strong as we were, as fast as we were, we were still very young, and in relation to whoever was in that Honda, probably very small, and not at all like Noemi, made hard as a needle by the world. So I readied myself for death. We stopped and held our ground while the little girl made it to us and paused in between our bikes, looking over her shoulder as the car slowly approached. I wanted the car to careen into the curb and then a corpse stumble out <laughs> of, the, of the passenger side and a greasy alien with a mouth like a lamprey eel and arms long as my whole body to burst from the windshield. But villains never look the way they should. Threats are often, un often surprising and unannounced. So it takes a lot of people to protect one another, especially little girls. The car sped off, and even though our eyes watched it go, we never saw the driver. Just like that, we were alone, the three of us. The day faded fast right before the gold street lights lit up the sidewalk. We had the dust to ourselves and moved exhausted again, through time, as if the shapes of the night could be anything we wanted. All right, it's Halloween. <coughs> A little creepy. Okay, I'm gonna do one more. Like I said, it's my distorted vision of Catholicism. <laughs> and then we'll close that. Where is that sort of guy? All right, so this one is called Black Communion. Oh, the part that was true from the other story, um, it was the uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practice, so there was a, a person and we had to, we had to um, practice with her, and she was just uh, Undefeatable, <laughs> and super little. It's like you just think you, you know. It's like I'm tall. I've been tall. I've been this height since I was like 12. So you get this like this illusion of, of domination. And like, no. Okay, so the next one, final round, Black Communion. It was Communion Day when Pastor Short announced before the congregation his engagement to a woman who was not our mother. I learned people just feed the possessions of the dead to goodwill so they don't sprout bad dreams that pretend to be memories. Instead of doing our little by little Sunday donations of daddy's clothes, we went to church. 
Communion was my favorite religious activity. We got to eat our God and drink his blood once a month. Christians are something else. <laughs> but I can't deny that it is a little bit empowering to think we can consume our creator and he'd be totally cool with it. <laughs> the ritual of getting dressed exhausted me. The dresses and the pumps and the matching sling purses, I hated it. T loved it. She loved the show, a pageant of sinners, all powdery and polished, ready to be doused with Jesus' bucket of forgiveness, even though she never stayed awake for half of it. When we left for church, Mama's makeup looked like something to peel off. Far too light, leaving the trunk of her neck dark, we never said anything. At least she was getting out of the house. Sister Bloom read the announcements. Couples, ministry, meeting times, vacation, Bible study schedule, building fun goals, out of all that BS, she left off a lot of the good stuff. So I was waiting for the main event. Catholics have a different process from what I saw on TV. They have communion every week and line up while a priest hand delivers a wafer directly into their mouths one at a time. It doesn't even stop there. Then they drink from the same cup of juice. There was no way I would get all dressed up for Pastor Short to slide an oyster cracker with his bare walrus fingers onto my tongue. G-T-F-O-H. Sister Bloom forgot to mention that Pastor Short had been fornicating with our mother for half a year since Daddy died. Second, she forget, forgot to mention the dick pic Pastor Short sent to my sister T. Then Sister Bloom forgot to mention that once T got that dick pic, he'd given up a lot of power and could never get it back, so he stopped coming over more and more until his absence forced Mama to actually go to church again and confront him. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, Sister Bloom failed to mention that Pastor Short was a greasy looking hypocrite, so I was like, whatever lady, you work on your building fund. <laughs> T ate and drank her sacrament before the big moment because she always forgot or never cared and was ready to fall into her creepy sleep again, sitting straight up with her eyes half open like a basset hound in a floral dress. <laughs> I saved my communion until after everyone else tossed back their cups. Jesus tastes like low sodium saltines and wait vulture grape juice. I was probably into carbs. Mama's makeup had blended well over the hours, turning her face into a dog of peanut butter. I considered telling her that Pastor Short's new fiance was ugly, which was true, but I hadn't developed a habit of talking to my mother. We weren't that kind of family. She'd been gripping the cues tightly for a while as if trying to balance herself, screaming beautifully in silence. I really thought I should say something. After the juice came the hymn, I know it was the blood the most jubilant chant about bathing in the vital fluids of a deity ever written. It had the cadence and delight of nursery rhymes. Though the irony on the people was not lost, a song and dance of the conquerors and the conquered, a kind of covenant beyond the moment to something deep into the future, with a fist around the past. Once the music was in full ecstasy, Mama made a sound. She said, huh, with her whole chest, a note between scorn and epiphany. Then I said it too. Except I was all scorn and no epiphany. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was the sugar and liquid dye and pureed fruit or the grit of salt and flour on our tongues that evoked such sudden calm. The church was disproportionately women, most of the men tending to the altar, circling the pastor while the audience of women with hands stretched out propped up the men in their elevation to heaven. I only imitated her revelation at the time, but my mother had figured it out that at any moment we women could remove our hands from the air Take back our obedience, our bodies, swallow our devotion, and the whole establishment would cave in like hollow bread. She understood how the price we pay to worship is grave and will tax us to the marrow, how the dead stay dead, and it is the living who will frighten, astonish, and disappoint. I always saved my sacrament because I wanted to eat the last of our God my own way. Okay. so much it's so uh, it's so um, interesting to me both how it deals with with, with um, stories of girlhood but the other thing that I sort of was struck by as I was rereading it was like it feels like it is also um, 
a really hardcore critique against capitalism, and I feel like, you know, Maybe. teenage <laughs> girls are such consumers, right? And so much is like marketed at girlhood. And I wonder if you could talk just a little bit about sort of how you, you threaded that through these stories. I didn't intentionally thread um, a <laughs> critique of capitalism through the stories, but I do think about people in that way, and sort of the, the systems that organize us, that kind of, you know, all, all the ways that we are governed through our choices, through the things that we're born into. And I was definitely in that mindset when I was, you know, writing the story. Of course, money and capitalism are impossible to escape, just, you know, just being alive in the world right now. So it's, it will definitely kind of seep in, but it was not an intention. But I love the analysis of that. <laughs> and one weird thing about being like a writer, you know, after a long time of you know, publishing and stuff, you start getting taught in classes. <laughs> and like, there were like other things that show up. I never expected that early in, in, in the days that this would <laughs> Like there would be that kind of angle on the work. Because for me, I'm always thinking just, you know, um, the sentence, the, the image. What does it make me feel? How do I, and how is it connecting to the one before and the one after and, and that kind of thing. So. So that is kind of fascinating, but it was not at all like the... <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, maybe you talk a little bit about language, because I think the, the language in your piece is, is just so, it's funny and it's poignant and it's beautiful. And I think sometimes we think about um, poetry as sort of the thing that, that is more concerned with language as opposed to fiction. Um, and they tell my students this a lot, right, that having more words isn't necessarily better because, mm -hmm. you know, you have to do good things with them still, but and, and you write a lot in flash. So I wondered if maybe you could talk about sort of how language influences your process and, and is part of, of your uh, ethos as a, a fiction writer. For sure. And I'm also um, a fiction writer that reads poetry, so I recommend it. I don't, I don't seek it out, but when it comes to me, <laughs> I accept it, and I don't judge it either. It's like I, I don't, I, I don't teach poetry classes. I don't sort of talk about meter or anything like that, but I do really have a deep appreciation for how they concentrate feeling, concentrate intention and sort of a vision within small spaces. And, um, and that kind of, that sort of approach to language is really healthy um, to think about as a fiction writer because you, you become more efficient, especially a oh, flash fiction writer too. So if you're looking for a sort of efficiency, starting with the poets is great. They're totally different forms, different objectives. Do not sort of, you know, um, think that yes, you know, call your poem a flash fiction piece. No, I will, I will fight you <laughs> on it because there are there are certain kind of you know rules and objectives you know that that go into each different each different form. I even view flash fiction as different from the short story as well. Like there is there are different um, agendas at work and possibilities at work too. The movement of through time in certain pieces like that. But I like what you said about um, overwriting to a degree. Of, you know, for for students. And it's usually towards the end where they don't know how to end a piece. They just keep writing more action, mm -hmm. sort of, you know. And that, that was my also my own, my own you know, habits. Sort of. So let me put the character in motion some more. And then you end up triggering a whole new kind of plot point that you have to manage again and again. Mm -hmm. And then it sort of just and it just keeps going. And instead of doing that, there should be more reflection where the character has to sort of stay still. You have to sort of evaluate what you've done so far. And I call it sort of taking inventory, going back through. The, all of the images, all of the, the action, things that have happened to this person, and then and then judging it, doing kind of a, a poetic analysis of that moment becomes the end of the story, mm -hmm. and a lot of times. So, so that's kind of like my my general approach to sort of sentences and and sort of what it all means, kind of collectively, and how to sort of condense instead of expand. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, um, and it was all the time for for flash fiction. Sure. I, I love the beauty though, that arises out of things on that language level, right? That, that there's real beauty in, in the simplicity of a sentence. Um, one of the things we do in my undergraduate workshop is we, we go around and share sentences that we liked from a draft. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like I always pick the simplest sentences, but those to me are the ones that are so evocative. Yeah. Um, and maybe you talk a little bit about like what you see Flash is doing that's maybe very different than, than long form storytelling or what you, you have the ability to do in Flash that you might not. Um, like time, so you can you can people think that you need more space to cover the you know, time periods, like you're writing a whole life or something like that. It's going to have to be a big book and you're an anacronic and all, all yeah. that. Kind of stuff. <laughs> no, you can do. And my favorite kinds of flash fiction stories are the ones that are they cover you know, a generation, they cover you know one person's whole life, or they cover the cosmos and everything else and all all together. One of my favorites does that. It's called. Um, 
the history of everything, including you, by uh, Jenny Holloway. So it does all of that. And you have to look at the, the way the, the patterns of the sentences are established early, and that will trigger time movement for the reader in, the, in their brain. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can sort of tell when things are going to slow down sometimes, the sentence will get longer. That means that, that actually you know, we're in, a, a, in, a, in a one moment. And the sentences get, bit, get shorter, that means we're clipping through years. And it's, it's a little trick in the brain that happens, you know, that, and, and each sort of flash fiction story has that ability to create its own kind of physics and dynamics for how to move through time in a way that like traditional stories have already commanded them to, to be in a certain kind of form. So you don't get that leeway, I think, with, with the longer pieces. We're told how they need to look, like it's already, you know, we're told how much you can really do in them. Um, already, and then you're kind of limited to that. I feel like flash fiction, as small as it is, it's more limitless mm. in that way. It kind of it gives you that ability to play with the reader's mind based on how you present your sentences and your, and your patterns. <laughs> if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. It does. All right. I'm going to switch gears just a little bit because we are during the tail end of, of Black History Month. And I wanted what to. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> February. Um, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about. Um, what it means to be uh, an underrepresented writer, both in, in publishing and, and if you feel like um, there's specific stories that you have to tell or, or some commitment that you have beyond sort of being a writer, you know, in, in the way that we all want to be a writer. I don't feel like I have to tell the stories that I do tell. They're the ones that just that are interesting to me. Mm -hmm. So I commit to them. And that is sort of the one, the most freeing thing I did for myself early, early back when nobody cared what I did, and I <laughs> and it is a freeing kind of point in time when there's, of course, there's an anxiety, uncertainty, like I want to be published, I do want to be a writer, I want to have a book, but uh, before all of that happens, nobody cares if you're a writer, nobody cares if you're a book, nobody has given you any deadlines, there is nothing but you and the page, and you can do anything, and during that time I realized that I wanted to do something for me. I want to write for me. What's the story that you know I, I want to read? What makes me excited? And then I kind of um, started going in those places. I stopped. And I, I really stopped trying to be Toni Morrison. <laughs> 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 that was a great gift to myself. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she could raise up, you know, and be like, "Yeah, I think that was a good idea." <laughs> Can't pull it off. But it's um, but it was that I was trying to write some kind of grand, you know, epic, you know, music, Negro spiritual kind of thing. And that's just not my voice. And that's not the thing that. Um, and also Toni Morrison terrifying me, all of her books terrify me, but they're, they're engrossing, but it's still, it's not my voice. It's not the thing that, that, I, that I had in my head. And it doesn't combine all of my different sort of interests. And also I want this at lunch, like I'm into cartoons, I'm into, I'm into fantasy kind of stories, I'm into Star Trek, <laughs> which is like weirdly, I mean like yeah, utopian cult colonialism at its best, when you really think about it. <laughs> but, um, but I'm into like that kind of thing, and sort of and combining it all, and sort of, and also, I grew up in Compton. Like I know, you know, the like, urban hood world and, and, and what it's like to be, you know, in that environment and still have a good time, but also still feel the pressures of danger all around. Like it's, it's all part of the mix of of my it's like aesthetic once I designed it. <laughs> and and that's sort of what I wanted to lean into. Um, and always want to lean into when I start writing. I'm working on my novel right now. I've I've written more novels, but the one that I know has to go out in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I'm writing that too, and I was I was looking at the character, the main character, and I've done a lot of pages and things, and I don't like her. <laughs> and it was because of that, like I was writing this character outside, too far outside of the things that are interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Like she was, she was also too good, too powerful, too capable, you know. And it's like, oh no, I can't hang out with you. <laughs> My people are a little bit broken. <laughs> they make mistakes, and then but they do they do tell good jokes. Like I want more and more of that more of that kind of uh, personality, and it's also more human as well. So I, I definitely have to sort of figure out that part for early work, and also it's an ongoing process. How did you how did you find that voice? And I think that the, one of the things that's that's really beautiful about your work is it is just so funny and so sad at the same time. Mm -hmm. And and I think that that those things come almost from line to line too, where the, where the tone really changes. So how did you find that voice and how did you relate on that? And I, I think I was mentioning this too, that um, I taught myself to figure out what I liked about my own writing by overwriting. So my, my MFA thesis, and I'll give you the, the horror story again, my MFA thesis was 300 plus pages or whatever, it was a big novel, and I reduced it down to four pages 
and publish that and walk away. <laughs> <laughs> and this isn't the first collection in Black Jesus. It's in there. And what, but what I did is I took a highlighter and I just went through the whole thing, not reading for context, but reading for lines. Mm -hmm. Reading for the line that was just by itself good. Like, I like it. You know? And sometimes I would have pages, you know, a few pages that would go. Or um, then, then nothing, then nothing. Scratch, you know, scratch, nothing, nothing, nothing. Or then one line on uh, the whole page and then just keep going, going, going. So it was, it was a lot of that. And then once I had those, that pages, I had to start reducing it. So I, was, I would lose some things, I had to, in order to sort of make the, the story work, sort of figure out how to collapse characters and uh, take certain action and put it into other places and that kind of thing. And that's when I started to figure out what I like to read that I knew I could produce. Yeah. So not just what I like reading from other people, because I do like reading other stuff, like Dwayne Morrison, yes, I love reading it. But now, but I know that I don't want to produce it. So I want to, I want to have that exist. But what, what I know is possible within me and the lexicon that I, I can command, I figured it out. So that was a really big kind of learning moment. It took me like whatever three years of writing that novel in the program to, to, to have it happen. And then it, from then on, it's just a practice. It's like yoga. Like, people, like actual yoga people, they don't say, I do yoga. I practice. <laughs> or something. It's a good way to think about writing, right? It we all practice. It's, like, it's, we it's get constant, better, you know? Yeah. And it changes every it time does. based on where you are in, in your day, in your life, in whatever it is. And you have to accept that and kind of work with it and keep just sort of meeting whatever, whatever um, um, you know, thing that is happening in, in, in the page for you there and just make it work for you at that, at that point. And sort of accept your brain, too, at that point. And um, I, have a, I have a, well, I can't ask it. Audience question, but. <laughs> but I know I was talking to you about the um, that that principle of should you write from Stephen King says write a whole book in three months, otherwise it'll keep changing over and over again. And for me, I think it's that the idea of you must let the book continue to change as you work on it. It will, and that's and that too is okay. Yeah. Don't rush it out and call it done if that's not part of your process. But also honoring the way that you will change every time you encounter the book to this writing. And that's, you know, it can slow things down for a lot of people. Um, I'm still waiting on Zee Packer's book for 25 years. Oh, God, <laughs> I know. I mean, <laughs> but there's a lot of people like that. Every day I see, like, look, hopefully, like, maybe this is the year, right? But I don't know. Well, I don't know. Know. And we just and we let that be, you yeah. know. And, and living too is writing. I have to restate that. So as you're collecting your experiences, collecting your perspectives on on life, that too is part of the writing process. And sort of you know, embrace that. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to open up for questions okay. a little bit. If, if you want to ask you Scott. Hi. Thank you for this. Sorry that I'm late. So today I heard an interesting interview with Penelope Cruz about this new Alda Movar movie. And she and the other woman, when they went to his house to read the script, started crying. And I don't know if the other one's a mother, but Penelope's a mother. And they couldn't stop crying. And he turned to them and said, I'm glad you're crying, but that's not what the characters do. And I don't need you to do what you do, I need you to do what the characters do. Mm -hmm. So she had to go into herself to understand, as a woman, as a mother, as an actress, how do I do this? And she reiterated through the interview that this isn't me, and I don't understand this woman, but I had to embody who I thought she was. And I heard that in what you said about this uh, character. And so then I'm, my question then is, everyone has their way. What is your engagement with that kid? Do you talk to them? Do you uh, some people write um, uh, genealogies? How do you communicate? with this, other than the writing of her out, how do you engage with her or him? I don't know if it's gender. This, this one is a her, but uh, I like that idea. And I also don't do those, 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 those strategies yeah. of sort of getting, to, you know, getting to know your character. I totally have a God complex. It's like, I'm, I know you. <laughs> I you. You do as I say. <laughs> so they don't, they don't have that, that kind of agency in my in my imagination of them at all. They do, they do definitely have a sound though. So I'm very I'm very when I say voice driven too, but it's also the the, the way the characters speak and think um, matters to me, and I feel like that's how I sort of access their psychology and sort of how they would make choices too, um, based on things like that. So I, I do think in those terms with them. 
but also I'm very objective. I'm also not precious about my characters. Like they can they can go. Sometimes they just have to, you know, out like I said, I'll collapse them like this guy. I like this moment, but nope, you don't get to exist anymore. I'm gonna take it and fold it into this other person. And I'm I'm totally comfortable with that. And it's in that in that process is much more easy. I, I get emotionally connected too when I hear them speak. Like the, the dialogue comes mm -hmm. out or something like that, and it and I, it does feel really true mm -hmm. and somehow separate from my own from myself. So I do mm -hmm. get kind of a, a weird kind of cognitive dissonance happens sometimes in that way from the from my, my position up here. Usually, you know, it sort of comes a little bit closer to to something um, something else, um, a little less. A less, a less authority and more kind of respect, I guess, I get for them <laughs> when, when, that, when that dialogue um, um, manifests in that way. Or just the narrator, you know, the, narr the narration if it's a first person or something like that. But I love uh, Pedro Amadot, you know, um, all of those movies. It's all about feminine madness. <laughs> It's like one of my, like my favorite genre of all time. <laughs> I recommend that you watch all of his films. Volver is one of my favorites. This new one is great too. I haven't seen, I haven't it. seen it, but um, oh, it's very good. And just really quickly, I'll give you it away. You have a twin story that brings people together in very different ways, and also is a historical narrative. Mm -hmm. So it's got a, a lot of dimension, just like very juicy, a lot to chew on. But the centrality of two women in relation. It's totally, yeah, I do want to see it. We don't get a lot of um, good movies, right? <laughs> and if they're there, they're like for two weeks or something and you missed it, so I gotta watch it. Just like here. Is that it? Okay. It's, yeah, Fresno is South Bend light. <laughs> warmer. Or warmer. South so Bend warmer, yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Can I ask how we balance like the specificity of places like John Juice? With the idea of like making a story that's not necessarily timeless but can continue to be read. That I don't think about like the how it will be read forever, but the timelessness is interesting. And I always mention this that at the ends of stores there should be this feeling of the future. Mm -hmm. And when I say future, it's not that the characters have more to do or that they need to be set in motion anymore, but they should feel as though that there that there is more. With, you know, for them, that, they, that their existence can continue. And that's a hard thing to accomplish on the page, but I think it's part of that t sort of timelessness thing. And when you read your, like your favorite works or whatever it is, they do feel like they're, they exist, you know, even when you're not looking at them. Like, <laughs> like there's something that's, that's very, very, very true and very connected to, to like the, a past, a present, and a future. I really do advocate having that sense of character. Like if I do anything, you know, with a, with an individual character or think about them, I do think about their histories. The thing that I won't put on the page, kind of a history, a present, and a future self. And the the, the past and the future might not make it on the page exactly. The present is all we're mostly what we're, we're dealing with, or maybe a couple flashbacks and like that. But it's that it's that history that is never seen and the future that is never seen that I want to still kind of get a hold of as I'm maneuvering these people and thinking about it. And it's not so much a future that is like very specific, like they went and accomplished this thing, or they, they're definite, but it's that the kind of existence, the feeling that they will have in the future, the feeling they had about their past. There's something there that I want to sort of, you know, be in between all the time and kind of have a, have a sense of. And also when they're not, when they're contrasting, um, you know, they, that's when you we have a really good character. When the, the, the past has a specific feeling that is not aligned with its future, good. Mm -hmm. Now you're now you're getting to a, a, a person, because that's how it is. <laughs> when we're when we're going through things, there'll be a moment, a trauma moment, moment that changes you forever. Be a, a wonderful moment that changes you forever, because you're in a totally di different trajectory than you were before, and that's that's the human experience. So I, I think about that sometimes, though, to connect those two <laughs> questions in a way. Um. So you were talking in the, about language and about time and like moving quickly through um, flash fiction, but I also noticed that there's um, that some of your stories feel like lyric essays to me, where you know it's it's not even moving through time; it's just moving almost like you know perpendicularly like through ideas. Like now I'm going to introduce this idea and this mm -hmm. idea, and yet there still is like a sense of narrative momentum. And so I wonder if you could like speak to that it's not you know often lyric essays are mostly like the, the narrative momentum i guess is in the the mind um the insight right the yeah judgments. yeah as opposed to just 
Yeah, so um, I'm very pro pro judgment. <laughs> very self righteous as like a as a as a, a authority over the over the, the work that's happening, but also the moments that are happening to different characters. And I don't I don't I, I love, you know, chronological stories, you know, that having a timeline that, that way, but that doesn't feel entirely true to memory. It doesn't feel true to kind of how we navigate our own lives at any given moment from, from birth to death, but also just sort of just in, in moments. We we're constantly thinking of something else and things are triggering those thoughts. And that's natural. The only thing that's unnatural is that we have to order that as fiction, as writers on the page, so it still sort of you know accumulates and, and, and turns into something that is cohesive. It becomes not, it's kind of like a spider web, kind of like a net of things, and you have to sort of, you know, you can pick your point of you know, starting wherever you want to do it in the story, but somehow it's all going to, it's all going to have to sort of be, be sewn together by the, by the end of it. So I do think about story structure that way. And each of those kind of little hinges, or what, what's in a net? Like, what's the, the joint or the, the string? I don't know. My metaphor is like just, just exploding. Yeah. Like, whatever those, those are the points of judgment, like the insight. Like the, that's where it kind of feels maybe a little essay-ish, you know, because that's how they, they have to sort of make, make theories and, and make their, um, their, their uh, assessments and their an analyses and things. I love that in language when you're a constant, you're not constantly, but sort of you let something happen and then you reflect. You know, and it's very small, and for flash fiction it has to be small, and it still has to have that insight into the moment and into also what it means for everyone, like a big judgment of all of humanity. If you can do that all in one sentence, now you're, now it's singing, now the, now it's you know that's that's when you're 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 in, some, in a really good place. But that's that kind of I like I like that I like to sort of you know have that kind of kind of design. It feels it feels much more authentic, authentic to, the, to the human experience. Yeah, I actually just want, this might just be like a really overly simplistic question, but I, I was really struck by how you mediate the kind of like adult voice dropping into girlhood. And I wondered if like you had to kind of go through processes to like get yourself in that headspace or like what you, I feel like, you know, when I try to think about what it was like when I was like 12 or 13, it's really hard. So yeah, that, that I was just curious about that. It's such a powerful time of life though, right? Yeah. And in this book, I did I did have kind of like a, a sense of myself when I was writing it, and I was thinking like, what is the book that I didn't have when I was this age, you know, mm -hmm. that I would have wanted to kind of kind of be be something that that understood that put words and names named the feelings I was going through, but also gave like a sense of permission to to be kind of irreverent, to have this sort of daring approach to life. And not sort of, you know, feel like you're doing everything wrong <laughs> all the time. So I kind of, you know, I had that in my brain too. Like the, like I said, to the to the mad mad girls, like uh, you know, I, mean, I was one of them. Just sort of, you know, kind of a little bit too smart, a little, but also didn't quite know enough. And the, and the the knowledge was being purposefully kept away. And then when you did learn something, you're like, oh no, that's that's bad. Mm -hmm. It's off limits. Keep it a secret. Keep it, you know, all these kind of things. So I was I was definitely kind of in that in that that feeling. And then, of course, your adult self has all the access to all the words, right? Mm -hmm. So I never lost that feeling. So I don't have a hard time looking back to, mm -hmm. to that period of, of life. So I think it was, for me, it was a little bit more, more accessible. Mm -hmm. But I definitely have a lot more words now than I did not have then. <laughs> and so I was able to sort of connect the two, two periods that way. I had a professor that called this process the sliding bubble of life how your perspective on any given moment changes as you age or as you're further away from it or whatever it is, the, the, the words that you'll have for it changes mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So um, so I kind of had that, that sort of part in mind too. So the voices are always a little bit far away. It's not too, too close in it. So that way you, you can sort of speak with more authority. You can use that you know insight and that judgment that the kid won't. So I never really write from like a 12 year old's person, you know, mm -hmm. voice too closely. It has to it's sort of, it's there, but it's also a little far. And I need it to be because because that's what I want to be and want to use as the gift to the self. <laughs> so you knit all the questions together so well too. <laughs> I see how you do the linked short stories because you brought them all together. Um, well, there are books for sale um, over here if you'd like to buy books. And Vinny has agreed to to sign books. But please um, join me in, in thanking her so much for being here.